this is Josh Rubin from East West Sailing and Performance, and today we're going to talk about part two of the female reproductive system. Now, I'll do some review, but before we begin, let's talk about some, well, they're not so much fun facts, but I guess they're facts. Um, and what I find interesting from, you know, I'm not a female, so of course I can't really touch upon the female cycle because I don't get it, but of course I've talked about how I feel sometimes I know more about the female cycle and reproductive system than my female clients, which I find to be a problem because I think in order to heal yourself, you have to understand what's going on. And when something's going wrong, if you understand how something works, you could actually, through nutrition, you know, fix it. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, we're not doctors. We're not saying that, you know, we have research published that nutrition alone can heal endometriosis or any of these things. What we're saying is it's a great support mechanism. Um, it's a great resource to provide your body with a healing nutrition foundation uh, to help you work through that process or that healing piece of the puzzle. Everyone's human. Everyone needs to eat. So we believe, from a, from a physiological standpoint, which I'll touch upon, that uh, nutrition can help. Now, what's interesting is, you know, most women are told that, you know, they're going to get their cycle. They're going to have menstrual cramps. They're going to have every ble heavy bleeding and clotting, etc. They're going to have to go on the birth control pill. And that's actually normal. That's the normalcy of what's going on in our society. And it's almost like we're setting women up for failure, setting them up to kind of a, a symptom-based model um, and letting them know that basically in this day and age that the menstrual cycle sucks and it's going to be bad. Um, and they're going to actually have those highs and lows every month. But what if you actually could control it, and based on the way you lived and managed your life and the way you ate, that getting your cycle wasn't actually a bad quote-unquote thing? And it's interesting because most people are taught that they're going to have to go on the birth control pill to control their cycle. And, you know, nowadays the birth control pill isn't really used. Of course it's used for birth control, but a lot of people are using it, and women are using it, and young girls are using it for cycle regulation and acting. Now, if you study the work of Dr. Ellen Grant from her work, The Bitter Pill, she says the pill, however, is a drug of social and sexual convenience that, is tra that its tragic consequences will continue to be disregarded until women fully realize what the consequences of such convenience are. Now, I'm not advocating going on it or off it or taking it or not taking it. I'm just letting you know what you're being taught without really doing the research. And like she says, for some women, it is a convenience. You know, I have acne. Oh, I take the pill and it goes away. But what else are you doing to your body? Over the past 40 years, there's been a dramatic increase in female-related illnesses. The average age for puberty has dropped to 10 years of age. We have to ask why. Endometriosis is affecting more than 5.5 million women. And it's the third leading cause of infertility. 75% of women suffer from PMS, 80% sorry, um, have been diagnosed with uterine fibroids, 170 to 300,000 170, 300, hysterectomies are performed annually due to uterine fibroids, dysmenorrhea affects approximately 40 to 70% of women of the reproductive age, and amenorrhea affects 25 to 60% of female athletes, 25% of them being runners because we're taught, you know, that running is healthy. Is it? We have to look at this and say, how are we living? Are we actually supporting the female body, the female reproductive system or not? Now, a lot of people are taught these things just happen. Personally, I believe the way you live and manage your life, the way you eat, how you are brought up, of course, how your parents lived and ate, etc., are all going to set the stage because some women suffer more than others, and some women don't. So we have to ask why. And what if you could get control back? What if you could regulate your cycle and turn that negative view of the cycle into a more positive view? Of course, this is a YouTube. I'm not going to give you all the answers, but hopefully through studying our work, possibly by working with us or doing our programs or downloading a lot of the free stuff we have through Facebook and YouTube and our free ebook, you kind of piece some things together to realize that you can take control back. Now, in part one, we talked about hormones, we talked about estrogen and progesterone. Now, our philosophy is all about balance. You know, 
It's not about estrogen is bad and progesterone is good. And you need more progesterone than estrogen. That's not true. You know, in all my years of doing this, the women that have actually gone on the, even the right type of progesterone when they really don't need it has put them into hormonal havoc. So it's about balance. It's about balance of everything we do without nutrition, our ratios, our grams, our frequency. It's about balance in life. It's about balancing all the different hormones, excitatory versus inhibitory, in our system to create balance. It's not about having an excess of one and deficiency of the other. It's about balance. So we learned that both are two hormones secreted by the ovaries and responsible to basically for regulating the cycle. They work together to maintain optimal balance at all times. And both are produced in the ovaries, adrenal glands, placenta, and stored in adipose tissue. And I think that's important to understand. Now, why in this day and age are we talking about estrogen dominance? Now, I'll touch upon a little bit more of this um, some of the causes because everyone thinks estrogen dominance is um, either too much estrogen or not enough progesterone. And that's one of the reasons, but there's, we have to look at why this is going on. This is a great chart taken from Nutrition and Women by Ray Pete, page 119, appendix 1993. And it's a great image to show that cholesterol is basically the building block for all your steroidal hormones. The manufacturing of your steroidal hormones from cholesterol takes place in tiny energy packets, we could call them, called mitochondria. The mitochondria are the energy producing parts of the cell. They're found in every part of the cell um, in the body except your red blood cells. Okay. Thyroid hormone, specifically T3, vitamin A, other vitamins and minerals are essential for this conversion of cholesterol into pregnenolone, you can see that on the slide. Cholesterol, conversion, mitochondria, what we use to pregnenolone. Now, I'm not advocating taking thyroid or taking vitamin A or taking vitamin E or taking copper. I'm advocating that if we use nutrition and understand the physiology of nutrition and where we can get these things and what eating the right types of carbs in relation to proteins and fats can do to thyroid conversion and how we can upregulate energy production in this conversion to pregnenolone, that's what I'm advocating. Pregnenolone metabolizes into progesterone and DHEA, as you can see. DHEA forms DHEAS, typically measured in labs due to its increased stability. That's what you typically see. Testosterone and three estrogens. Everyone thinks estrogen is estrogen. It's actually estrone, which is E1, estradiol, which is E2, and estriol, which is E3. Progesterone is the precursor to both cortisol and the mineral corticoid aldosterone. In a metabolically healthy or balanced or well-nourished fed body, the formation of pregnenolone from cholesterol, which is quite interesting, right, because everyone thinks cholesterol is bad, is efficient and minimizes the need for cortisol by inhibiting ACTH. Cortisol is synthesized by progesterone and released by the adrenal glands in response to stress. Although a normal physiological response, chronic Chronic stress results in altered hormonal pathways and vitamin and mineral deficiencies. So it's really important to understand that cholesterol is a precursor to all this production. And over 80% of the cholesterol in the body is produced in the body based on how we eat and how we live. Less than 20% is produced based on how we eat. But this is important because we have to look at the types of carbs, fats, and proteins we're eating, as well as the, you know, the types the ratios so we can get thyroid hormone production, so we can get regulation of energy production, so we can get these different minerals and vitamins in our food, so we can produce pregnenolone, so we can produce progesterone and DHEA, so we can produce all these, this balance in these inhibitory versus excitatory hormones to create balance in the body. Deficiencies in thyroid hormone, vitamin A, light from getting outside, deficiencies in vitamin E, copper from not eating enough shellfish, decrease the conversion of pregnenolone and progesterone, stimulating the production of cortisol, which is a glucocorticoid, which is designed to regulate blood sugar and fight inflammation, as well as DHEA and other androgens. And you typically see DHEA go down as we age. The question is, does it go down because we age, or does it go down because of how we're eating or what we're not doing or how we're living? 
When a system is more heavily compromised and has a low resilience to stress, the system is only capable of sustaining cortisol and aldosterone production, leading to degenerative problems, progesterone deficiencies, and estrogen excesses, based on how we live. Quoting Ray Pete, estrogen offers no physiological benefits other than that of reproduction, and even in reproduction, estrogen shock effects must be tightly regulated by a well-balanced body. How we live, how we eat, to create that balance. According to Hans Selye, he showed that estrogen actually mimics the shock phase of the stress reaction or stress response. And when left unopposed by progesterone, because we're not producing energy, because we don't have enough thyroid hormone, because we're vitamin A deficient, because we're vitamin E deficient or copper deficient and not getting enough light to stimulate cytochrome oxidase in the mitochondria, because we're eating a diet at high in unsaturated fats, because we're taking you know, estrogen creams or birth control pill, or because we're trying to lower our cholesterol, we basically leave estrogen unopposed. And this can greatly contribute to, of course, suppression of the thyroid, which we see in low body temperature and pulse upon waking in bed, breakdown of fatty acids and protein for energy production, which is not an efficient way of producing energy, which is living in a survival mode, which is basically what you're doing with the ketogenic diet or a high protein, low carb diet. You can see an increase in blood pressure as an adaptation to this process. Increase, um, I'm sorry, the inability to store glycogen in the liver, which can lead to cravings and blood sugar handling issues, highs and lows in energy during the day, and of course, thyroid dysregulation, blood sugar dysregulation, of course, decreased blood volume leading to edema. And with pregnancy, you typically with that will see preeclampsia, diabetes, and high blood pressure, as well as increased vasoconstriction. Of course, some of the symptoms we could say of unopposed estrogen. I don't like using the word estrogen dominance because there's so many meanings to that, which I'll touch upon. Of course, our cramping, heavy bleeding, clotting, fibroids, endometriosis, uh, PCOS, um, swollen breasts, mood swings, memory loss, weight gain, edema, foggy thinking, gallbladder disease, hair loss, irritability, headaches, hypoglycemia, etc. But that could be going along with anything. What we know is we're not getting a conversion of cholesterol to our protective hormones. Something is out of balance. Now, what are the causes of estrogen dominance? What are causing, what's causing this imbalance? Of course, we have to look at our physiology, we have to look at what's going on as well in our life. Of course, stress of any type, stress is a stress is a stress. You can stub your toe, eat a Pop-Tart, or get in a fight, the body reacts the same way. The body has one response to stress. And it's your nervous system that's going to make the call. It's your, it's your nervous system that's interpreting the stress. Exercising too much, not exercising enough, poor eating habits, poor time management, emotional stressors, physical stressors, environmental stressors, the body reacts the same way. And we're going to get because most people aren't eating the right foods and the right ratios and not storing glycogen, we're going to get an overstimulation of adrenaline and cortisol, a decreased production of estoral hormones, which is going to lead to blood sugar handling problems and suppression of thyroid hormone com conversion. Of course, aging, the ability to produce protective hormones such as progesterone and pregnenolone decreases while we age and estrogen actually increases. We could say in most the inability to detox if I, it actually increases, and that's why we see in a lot of women as they age, they get um, that kind of, you know, myxedema-like symptoms, the edema, the uh, gallbladder disease, and things like that. The inability of the liver to detoxify estrogen, this comes from malnourishment, and a lot of the times it comes from a protein deficiency by suppressing liver function, increases estrogen, because the liver actually needs high-quality proteins like shellfish, whitefish, low-fatty whitefish, uh, dairy, eggs, um, uh, gelatin, broth, these power proteins to detoxify estrogen, but in relation to a good amount of right, a good amount of the right type and quality of carbohydrates. Exogenous sources such as plastics and other xenoestrogens, of course. Birth control pills, which I touched, touched upon, these are basically estrogen contraceptives. Um, and they basically prevent implantation of the embryo into the uterus, which basically creates an abortion. Estrogen in the body, whether it's a birth control pill or not, is going to cause hypoxia of the cell, 
And when the embryo wants to implant itself, become a fetus, that's when most people get that miscarriage or abortion. It's week 8 to 12. And it's usually estrogen that's causing the hypoxia at the cell level. It's not allowing the cell to use oxygen efficiently to produce energy. Of course, obesity in postmenopausal women. This causes the body to increase its production of estrogen through our fat cells, further perpetuating inflammation and other metabolic dysfunctions. Obes obesity is an inflammatory disease. Of course, hysterectomies, hysterectomy, sorry, uh, premenopause are other causes, um, and polyunsaturated fats. Polyunsaturated fats, based on our research and the work of Ray Pete, we should say the excess intake of them are immunosuppressive, they're antithyroid, pro-diabetic through increasing the body's use of free fatty acids for energy. It, they inhibit cellular respiration and promote the actions of estrogen and cortisol. Of course, other causes. For me, it's usually the inability to detox estrogen, low progesterone or low progesterone levels, vitamin A deficiencies or cholesterol deficiencies. So we have to figure out with that person what's going on because if someone has the inability to detox estrogen and that's why, quote unquote, they're estrogen dominant and you start giving them progesterone, it's going to do nothing to help them, if anything, make them bleed even more. So it's important to know who you're working with, not to diagnose them, but understand who you're working with and where their hormonal dysfunction is actually coming from so you can maybe help them nutritionally regulate the detoxification of estrogen with balancing food frequency blood sugar as well as providing them with certain proteins and carbohydrates that actually prevent the reabsorption of estrogen. So what are some things that you can actually do to regulate the hormonal cycle? Or regulate, we could say, estrogen levels. Of course, balance your blood sugar. Eat frequent meals, balance meals of proteins, carbs, and fats, but it comes down to eating the right types of carbs, proteins, fats, based on our philosophy. Of course, managing your life stressors, avoiding unsaturated fats, and a lot of this can be done through eliminating fatty fish, eliminating most above ground vegetables. That's a good place to start. Avocados, fats that contain you know, fish oil, cod liver oil, things like that because of their estrogen-like qualities through affecting thyroid hormone conversion, inhibiting cellular respiration, which is energy production, wasting glucose, causing blood sugar dysregulation, and basically perpetuating the vicious cycle of inflammation. We recommend with some people taking Epsom salt baths. Typically with excess estrogen um, or the inability to detoxify it, you'll see water retention, and this is secondary to the increased uptake of water in the tissues and low albumin levels in the liver caused by malnutrition and the overburdening on the liver. And you see this a lot in pregnancy. This is why women get high blood pressure, preeclampsia, toxemia, etc. At this estrogen dominance leads to an excessive uptake of magnesium, creating an imbalance in the intra and extracellular minerals, leading to water retention due to the uptake of sodium in the cell secondary to this magnesium deficiency. So nutshell, you're going to get magnesium in the Epsom salt baths, which can help with swelling over time if done consistently. But I'll tell you this, taking them by themselves isn't going to do it. You have to make sure that you, you're creating a nutritional foundation by eating the right foods for yourself and the right ratios to regulate your blood sugar to set the stage so you can absorb the magnesium and get the benefit from the Epsom salt bath. And last but not least, eat adequate amounts of the right types of protein to actually help liver function, help the liver store glycogen, and help the liver detoxify estrogen. So hopefully you've enjoyed this YouTube. I know it's a lot to take in. We got a lot of other great resources from our YouTube page to our Facebook page which you can find on our website. You can download our free ebook at eastwesthealing.com called The Stress Reduction Manifesto. It's free. As well as check out our other online programs. They're Go at Your Own Pace, The Metabolic Blueprint, and Fight Fatigue with Food. Thanks for tuning in, my friends, and I'm out of here.